Thank you so much for that incredibly generous introduction. I want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're on tonight and to pay my respect to elders past and present. Uh, we're on the land of the Ghana people and um, I, I know that uh, you South Australians uh, have set up your own voice and uh, we did manage it at a national level but we've still got an enormous amount of commitment to um, making sure that our First Nations Australians have the recognition and the proper place in our nation that they deserve. I also want to acknowledge my friend Susan Close, the Deputy Premier. I love working with Susan, I cannot tell you. I mean, I do get my instructions on the Murray Darling. I, um, I love working with Susan. I've known her for many years in a range of different portfolios and every time I'm just bowled away by the intelligence and integrity that she brings to her work. It's lovely to see you here, Susan. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to whiz through the others. I will be here all night acknowledging people. But we've got Emily Burke with us, the Assistant Minister for Autism. Um, and of course, uh, Olivia uh, Savas. We've got um, former MPs Annette Hurley, Anne Levy, Gay Thompson, uh, Vinnie Chicarello. We've, from South Australian Labor, we've got Eamon Burke and Penny Pappas. And I particularly want to thank you, Reggie, for organising tonight, uh, for uh, once again for that very generous introduction. Uh, and I want to thank um, our friends uh, at the SDA for sponsoring this evening. That's very kind of them. This is the inaugural Elizabeth Rose Henry oration. And because it's the first, I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about this magnificent woman. Why are we celebrating her in particular? What is her legacy? When Reggie told me that he wanted to uh, establish this oration, he said uh, it would make Liz Henretti, a household name in South Australian Labor circles. It is the very least that our longest serving party official and first woman secretary deserves. And I completely agree with Reggie. What an incredible woman Elizabeth Rose Henretti was and what a legacy she's left. I want to talk a little bit about how Elizabeth's work is a brick in the path to gender equality and an exemplar of the best of Labor. I also want to talk about how Elizabeth's work remains incomplete and that it's up to us to build on what she achieved. But first, who was Elizabeth Rose Henretti? Elizabeth was born in 1881 in North Adelaide, one of 11 children, to an Irish mother and an English father. She was the fifth of 11, and when her father died, she was just seven and her mother, Bridget, had to support and raise 11 children. Times were, as you can imagine, tough for a single mum of 11 in an era before the social safety net. And so Elizabeth was sent to work aged 12 at the completion of her primary schooling. At 12, she worked as a domestic servant and nursemaid. By 14, she was working in a laundry as a presser she told the Adelaide Advertiser in an interview in 1924, I quote, I was accustomed to fighting because life was always more or less of a struggle for existence when mother was left a widow with a young family. I was able to leave the North Adelaide Public School and became one of the breadwinners in earnest. I was only 12 years old then and I thought it was a great privilege to be allowed to sleep at home when I got a place as domestic help and nursemaid four shillings a week. In 2024 in Australia, we can scarcely comprehend that a 12-year-old was sent into the workforce and more to the point, she was grateful to be allowed to sleep at home. It's worth reflecting on the working conditions at the time for children. The working children of this era worked long hours, typically a 10 to 14 hour day for very little pay. On average, children were paid about one third of the adult male rate. A child in a rope works in Melbourne, for example, earned seven shillings for a 50 hour week in 1884, compared with an adult male who earned about two pounds. Young children endured harsh conditions with reports of children 
and I quote, crowded into small rooms which are suffocating in summer and intolerably cold in winter. In one factory, there were seven men and four boys in a small room with no ventilation. Children were put in charge of steam boilers and other powered machinery, sometimes with disastrous consequences. The Advertiser reported in 1899 that, and I quote, children under 10 years of age were employed in suburban factories, and it is common, it is a common occurrence for them to have their fingers taken off in the machinery. Diseases such as typhoid, diphtheria, and whooping cough spread in unsanitary factory conditions. And in laundries where Elizabeth worked once she turned 14, the conditions were hard and dirty. We're horrified now at the thought of a 12-year-old girl in this country leaving school as a servant. But in the 1880s, during Elizabeth's girlhood, children had limited rights and women, women had limited rights in most spheres, in families, in employment and in citizenship. Of course, that changed in the decades that followed and Elizabeth and the broader labour movement would be a vital part of that change. While working at the Adelaide Laundry, a young Elizabeth encountered labour activist Lillian Locke, the leader of the labour movement in Australia. And what a fortuitous meeting that turned out to be. Picture a young woman working in a laundry in the bleakest set of circumstances, meeting this charismatic labour reformer and suffragette, Lillian Locke. Lillian Locke was described in the press as a brilliant organiser and propagandist and one of the ablest women labour platform exponents in the Commonwealth. Lillian regularly travelled around Australia campaigning for women's rights and the rights of workers. And I'm sure would have been an inspiring mentor and champion of the working women that she met on the road. What a debt of gratitude we and generations of Australians <laughs> owe the union movement. What they have given us and continue to give us collectively and as individuals is impossible to quantify. And once they met, Elizabeth joined Lillian in forming the Women's Employment Mutual Association in Adelaide in 1905. She was then aged 24. And the course of her life changed when she joined the fight for a better deal for workers. In 1909, Elizabeth represented the employees on the Laundries and Wages Board, and in 1911, she represented the Trades and Labour Council on the Royal Commission on the Shortage of Labour in the Clothing and Boots Trade. Elizabeth's involvement in the public fight for a better deal for workers was unusual at the time, and directly motivated by her own experiences in the workforce. It was unusual because women were still mainly confined to the domestic sphere. Historian Raylene Francis, an emeritus professor at ANU, said that without such critical experiences of working in poorly regulated and underpaid industries, a quote, women were much less likely to engage in industrial activities. She says, family structures and gender divisions of labour combined with gender differences in paid earnings affected women's participation in the labour market and also their inclination and capacity to engage in organisation and leadership. Well, Elizabeth would have found these separate gendered spheres, public and private, were replicated in the factory and in politics. Professor Francis says, women seeking leadership roles in unions in this period often faced formidable obstacles, not least of which was the attitude of male unionists. <laughs> Thankfully, of course, that's all changed. <laughs> When the Tayloresses began to organise in the, this is still Professor Francis, when the Tayloresses began to organise in the 1880s, many tailors were not interested in joining with them in solidarity. Oh, let the women look after themselves, one of them said. They have taken our jobs. <laughs> things have changed for women in modern Australia, but in Professor Francis's account, there are some things that strike me still as familiar the structural barriers to political participation. In 2024, women still do the majority of unpaid care work, 70% according to ABS statistics, whether it's looking after children or older people or running a household, they're the family organisers and the diary managers. 
For many, this vote doesn't leave a lot of time or headspace for politics and activism. But there's also a backlash to our current wave of feminism, where men say, let the women look after themselves. And in fact, this is something that really troubles me. In many respects, we're going backwards. According to a study by Ipsos UK in 2023, there is an upswing of young men who believe that feminism is harmful. Feeding this backlash, of course, is social media algorithms that push young men towards harmful misogynist content, the sort of Andrew Tates of the world. Gender inequality is something that generations of women have had to collectively work together to overcome. And we are still working to overcome it today. And when we fight for the rights of others, we find our own voices and we see the benefits in our own lives. When, I, I think, who, who was here? Just hands up, who was at the 1994 conference in Hobart where we did the affirmative action <laughs> rules? Yeah, here we go. <laughs> you would remember that when the affirmative action rules were passed, all of the women who were observing ran down onto the conference floor. Yes. We were so happy, we were so delighted, we were cheering and celebrating, not because we expected to benefit ourselves, but for everybody, for all of the women who would come after. I didn't expect that I'd be running for parliament four years after that. It's the work of the Labor Party, but also of organisations like Emily's List and the Muriel Matters Society that you've got here in South Australia that have kept this momentum going. For Elizabeth, it was the involvement in the Labor movement that would ultimately lead to her own greater mobility out of the laundries. And it led to her formal education. After the formation of the Women's Association with Locke, Elizabeth trained in typewriting in business college. And even this modest technical qualification was a sacrifice, a financial sacrifice for someone from a poor background. <coughs> and it was like that until the Whitlam government revolutionised higher education in the 1970s. Yes. Elizabeth said, I had paid for my learning and I wasn't going to waste the money Every 10 minutes at the typewriter meant a long walk. She meant instead of being able to afford to catch the bus um, or a scratch meal for me. And I made the most of it. I was beginning to realise the true value of service and that everything good has to be bought by sacrifice. Before those seismic reforms by Gough Whitlam, many working class Australians were self-taught or they learned to read through initiatives by the union movement through working men's associations, the WEA and other colleges around Australia. My friend Dick Adams, who was a member of the Federal Parliament and former member of the Lions in Tasmania, he taught himself to read as an adult. He was a timber worker, he became a union organiser, and he had to write a letter as part of his work for his delegates. He realised that he didn't have the skills and he devoted the next four years sitting around his kitchen table in the evenings, learning from a tutor provided by the union movement until he could read and write to the degree he needed to. After leaving school at 12, Elizabeth was also <coughs> self-taught. In that Adelaide Advertiser interview in 1924, Elizabeth talked about the role of books in her life. She said, I was an omnivorous reader and I progressed from the penny novelette to some of the finer literature of the language by easy stages. At first, I could not read anything that had not a story in it, but by and by, I realised that the age-long struggles of humanity were the greatest and most dynamic romances of all time. <laughs> Under all, she keeps... She goes on, under all the picturesque tales of the French Revolution, I began to seek for the underlying political causes. From that, I got down to the bedrock idea of looking for the underlying cause when I had to deal with any industrial matter. Isn't that a beautiful expression? <laughs> yes. The age-long struggles of humanity 
were the greatest and most dynamic romances of all time. It's from a girl who left school at 12. From there, Elizabeth's life developed a trajectory, and it's the trajectory of a joiner and a reformer. And I think many of you who are here tonight would be familiar with this path, having walked it yourselves. It's a path that inspired me to join the Labor Party. When I gave my first speech to Parliament in November 1998, I said something like, we are steeped in this tradition of collective action, <coughs> community activism, and it's that which gave birth to the Labor Party. Well, Elizabeth formed the Women's Political Education Association in 1914. <coughs> she had been a member of the North Adelaide Committee of the South Australian United Labor Party from 1905. In 1914, she was appointed permanent organiser for the party as a lead organiser <laughs> to increase women's membership. Uh, during World War I, she was an outspoken critic against conscription. She became, as Reggie has said, the Assistant State Secretary of the South Australian branch in 1917, and she remained in that role until 1956, a massive 40 years. And even if Elizabeth had done nothing else, that would be a service worth marking. But of course, it's not all she did. In 1924, Elizabeth became a Justice of the Peace, demonstrating her interest in public service. This was a voluntary role, of course, as were most positions available for women to make public contributions to society. Women were only able to become JPs in 1921 after legislation had to be passed to allow women to be appointed. Um, the, the definition of people didn't include that. <laughs> they had to change the law because people didn't include women. Um, Elizabeth was one of the first generation of women to take on the role of JP in South Australia. And she was described as Labor's best known JP by 1928. Having a role for women in the court system, even if it was a voluntary one, was a key concern of the women's rights movement, who believed that women's perspectives were crucial in administering justice, particularly in cases involving women and children. Elizabeth's public service and interest in social reform and support the vulnerable community members was acknowledged when she was appointed to the Mental Defectives Board in 1925. Women, um, I mean, some of the language really. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Elizabeth strongly advocated for women to become involved in the Labor Party and became president of the first annual conference of South Australian Labor Women in 1928. And it was that conference that formed Labor's Women's Central Organising Committee. In 1930, Elizabeth gained publicity for presenting at the Women's Basic Wage Inquiry to argue that women should be paid enough to have clothes made. Equal pay remained one of the key reforms that Labor women have fought for to this day and almost 100 years later remains a key objective in the fight for gender equality. Elizabeth was also the Vice President of the Housewives Association and campaigned on food prices during the Great Depression, provision of milk for school children, she kept a watch on fuel charges and argued for better housing. She was a staunch advocate for a livable wage for all women workers and opposed employment discrimination against married women. She also advocated for increased representation within the party equal rights and privileges for women in public office and for women's parental rights. She consistently <laughs> encouraged other women to run for public office, although she never did so herself. Then in 1947, she made history by becoming the first woman secretary of the South Australian Labor Party for just a few months. After the, a few months after the retirement of the secretary and before a new secretary was elected at the next ALP convention. A newspaper profile at the time described her as a kindly, grey-haired woman. <laughs> and I'll tell you, anybody who, anybody who stays in dead office for 40 years is not the one you to And they said, the newspaper profile said of her leadership style, 
Ms. Henry does not intend to move from her tiny desk just to find the inquiry counter at the ALP office. Henretti did not publicly consider running for elected office. She spoke of how I never recovered from my shyness, and every time I spoke, I used to think the loud beating of my heart would drown my words, despite being described as an effective and persuasive speaker. That was in the newspaper um, profile of her. But was Elizabeth ever encouraged by the men in the party to take a more public or a more senior <laughs> role? <laughs> as Reggie was saying earlier, as a former, he, this is uh, something he's written about, uh, Elizabeth Henry. As a former party secretary, I find it troubling that Liz Henry was never appointed to that office despite running for the position, except on an active base basis in 1947, between the resignation of one man and the appointment of another. <laughs> in this brief time, she became SA Labor's first woman secretary. Reggie said, her absence from labour law is a poor reflection on the misogyny that prevailed in our society for far too long. So politics is like a house with many rooms, and one room leads to another room until you get closer and closer to the seat of power. And of course, the final room is the watch. In a chamber of that house is cabinet. And for too long, the women of our party were kept in the outer rooms, or disgracefully, in the case of Elizabeth, allowed a brief visit when it was convenient for the blokes. <laughs> Eventually, the lack of women's representation in the Labor Party was formally remedied by quotas, and um, that, of course, was at the National Conference in 1994. But people like Elizabeth Hanrehi were at the coalface of that fight long before. In 2024, we now have a situation where parties that don't advance women in their ranks and parties that don't have policies that benefit women doom themselves to irrelevance. In 2015, the Liberals set a target of 50% female representation in Parliament and 50% female representation in Liberal branches and executives, so by 2025. They, of course, had no plan on how they were going to manage that. They now have fewer women in Parliament <laughs> than when the Liberal Party Federal Executive sent, set their gender parity target nine years ago. <laughs> An analysis in March 2024 by the Australian Institute found that currently of the 228 members of Parliament who sit in Liberal Party rooms across the country, just 71 are women. And what has that done to the Liberals? Where has it left them? In the wilderness. Um, like I have to say, completely unrepresentative. Peter Dutton, has failed to deliver. He just doesn't seem to care about this incredible inequality in their representation. Sadly for them, uh, liberal woman after liberal woman can attest to how the party blocks their path to seniority, even when great female candidates are available. And Julie Bishop was the latest liberal woman to call out the party this week, speaking on the Future Women podcast. As the only woman in a cabinet of 20 under Tony Abbott, Prime Minister and Minister for Women, <laughs> Bishop says she felt she couldn't speak out at the time about the lack of female representation. Through lack of action, the Liberal Party have actually gone backwards from that low point <coughs> Currently now just 26% of their party room are women. That is the lowest in 30 years. Anne Ruston uh, has been bumped off the top of the Senate ticket in favour of a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> All of the, like, seat after seat, no women pre-selected, lack of women on the front bench, uh, the experience of women like Julia Banks and Julie Bishop who uh, will tell you that they were hounded out by the Boys Club, and that's just recently. And you know what? You reap what you sow. The results for the Liberals are the teals. Women who should be in the Liberal Party, winning seats that the Liberals should be able to take for granted, and previously did. Seats where most of their members live. Seats where most of their donors live. The Liberals are so out of touch that they don't actually know why they've lost these seats 
And, you know, if you're watching politics from a distance, it's plain as the nose on your face, it's climate, it's gender, it's integrity. But instead, the Liberals have convinced themselves that um, the more progressive end of the Liberal Party have lost their seats to the Teals because they're too progressive. <laughs> True story. At, at the time, um, when Elizabeth Hanredi uh, was um, arguing for more women to become engaged in politics, a hundred years ago, she said, we want the women to discuss things and not to hide their light under a bushel. And we feel sure that this means that women who have always done the house-to-house -house canvassing and other election work <laughs> will have much more to say in the future about shaping our party's policy. And yet, she also noted that when it came to women running for office, she said, I quote, there is nothing to hinder a woman being nominated but I don't know of any woman who is likely to want to be. Showing her hesitancy at being subjected to the public scrutiny that came with elected office. And I can tell you, 100 years down the track, that that public scrutiny for women running for public office is still more intense, um, certainly more intense than the scrutiny that men face. And the backlash on social media is worse for women politicians than it is for men. Does anybody really think that if um, a woman had uh, behaved as Barnaby Joyce did, um, you know, uh, a few weeks ago, over a longer period, <laughs> 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 they would still be in common. No. Recognition came late for uh, Elizabeth Henry. She was awarded an MBE in 1957 in recognition of her work as the Assistant Secretary of the South Australian Labor Party. And there is a street named after her in Canberra. She died in 1967, aged 86, two years before I was born. But you know, I am grateful every single day to her and to the women like her that made my generation's path easier. And I feel it as such an intense obligation to do the same for the generations that come after me. The late, great Labor speechwriter, Graham Freudenberg, once said, Labor is collective memory in action. And so it is here, with the work that the modern party has done to further the work of Elizabeth Hanretti. In September this year, it will be 30 years since the ALP decided to introduce quotas at that national conference. I was there as a staffer on a small desk 30 years later, for the first time in Australian history, a majority women government was elected federally. Women make up 53% of the Labor caucus federally, with 55 women out of 104 MPs and senators. Half, Half the cabinet are women. Parliament House has a crash where the members' bar used to be. <laughs> the campaign within the party for affirmative action has paid off. We are not at the big table as individuals. We are there because we share common values in fighting for collective rights. Our issues are wages, paid parental leave, ending violence against women and children. Gender impact is considered in every cabinet submission and across every portfolio, finance, treasury, IR, health, education, science and technology. I really would encourage all of you to read the fantastic gender equality strategy released uh, recently by the Minister for Women, Katie Gallagher. A result of years of work in opposition, given life and heft by the election of a Labor government. Working for Women, a strategy for gender equality is the Albanese government's 10-year commitment to gender equality. Working for Women will drive government action on women's safety, sharing and valuing care, economic equality, women's health and women's leadership, representation and decision making. Women have been activists within the Labor Party and have been responsible for some of the recent big wins we've had, paid parental leave, domestic paid domestic violence leave, roles in marriage equality and anti-nuclear campaigns. All of these have been led by women in parliament and by women in the union movement. And in the Albanese Labor government, we are continuing to fight 
and to deliver. For women's economic equality, for fairer wages for women, particularly in the aged care sector and next up, early childhood educators, for superannuation on paid parental leave, for expanding the parenting payments single, for increasing transparency, to reduce the gender pay gap, and for accepting all 55 recommendations of the respective work report. Because labour is collective memory in action. The long struggles of humanity were the greatest and most dynamic romances of all time. How many of you here tonight joined the party in the spirit of this great dynamic romance? Love for one another, for strangers we'll never meet, for children not our own, for ideals of equality and justice, for people who will never know how hard we fought for them. That's why I joined. In fact, I think almost all of us here who are called or attracted to serve in progressive movements have a deep yearning to be part of that dynamic romance. Study the Australian story of the fight for gender equality and you'll see how hard women have fought and you'll see that fight speak from place to place across time. Lillian Locke speaks to Elizabeth Henretti, who speaks to Dorothy Tangy, who speaks to Margaret Whitler, who speaks to Elizabeth Ray, who speaks to Susan Ryan, who speaks to Anne Summers, who speaks to Jenny Macklin, who spoke to me, who I, and I hope I have the opportunity to speak to the next generation of amazing young women coming through our party, including the 14 new Labor women MPs elected in the 47th Parliament and our new Labor women senators. This dynamic romance of labour is one of forward momentum, constantly improving things with each generation. The party and its people, and Elizabeth Henretti, was a certain type of labour person that really is the best of us. I think these words from Elizabeth really sum up this type of labour person. She said, I was never able to afford hobbies but that did not prevent me from loving art. And I spent much of my scanty time, mostly in my luncheon hour, in the art gallery. I suppose some people would sneer and scoff at meat pies and art, but I thought, it, I thought how nice it was to escape from realities for a while. I, I think that describes the best of the Labor people I know, the men and women who are comfortable at the pub and in the theatre who love ideas and debate, sport and the outdoors, meat pies and art, bread and roses. They don't seek to enrich themselves, they seek to enrich society. They gravitate towards the collective. They want to leave things in a better shape after they've gone. For all of us, for the people they will never meet, for the ideals and ideas that we share. We are labour, but from many backgrounds. But above all, these Labor people, people like Elizabeth Rose Henretti, share the same values. When I go to a branch meeting, there are 18-year-olds and 18-year-olds. There are uh, people who've been working hard in blue-collar jobs all their lives and uni students. And even though on the face of it, they might seem to have nothing in common, they share the most fundamental thing. They share their values, Labor values.